Did gladiator fights have referees? Were there different kinds of gladiators? Did they warm up before the fight like football players do today? Welcome back everybody, this is Kronos and today we're going to dive into the gladiator pits in ancient Rome. So many questions and misconceptions about these ancient warriors. Let's take a look. Back in the day, the Munera Gladiatoria was the show in the Roman world. It brings to mind images of gladiators, men condemned to fight to the death, but like so many other things, it is just a myth. Sure, there were some real battles in the arena, but only when the combat was to the death. Most of the time, gladiators survived, even going on to win their freedom. The profession of a gladiator was considered infamous within Roman morality. Originally, gladiators were not professionals. They fought in religious ceremonies to honor the memory of the dead, like funerary games but soon became true professional fighters. Ancient Roman gladiators were mostly slaves or prisoners of war, but some chose the profession to pay off their debts. Those who wanted to become a gladiator were educated and trained in the gladiator school, which was called ludus, where they'd learn all the necessary skills to survive in the arena. The oldest and most famous school was in Capua, where the famous gladiator rebellion led by Spartacus took place back in the year 73 before Christ. There were also gladiator schools in the provinces, but the biggest and best school was in Rome, the Ludus Magnus, built by Domitian close to the Colosseum. Everyone who wanted to be a gladiator had to go through a tough selection process to assess their qualities as there was a specific hierarchy. Tyrones, the lowest, the veterani, the magistri, the doctores, and finally, the lenista. The latter was responsible for the maintenance, training, and organization of the fights. He contacted a publisher or sponsor and rented the services of his gladiators. Thanks to movies, we have the impression that battles always ended with the death of the defeated. But that's not entirely true. Gladiators were a pricey investment. They were fed well, had access to medical care, lodging, and training. So, naturally their manager or lanista would want them to survive the battles. Also, the audience were not as bloodthirsty as we have seen in the movies. Most of the time, they did not want the death of the gladiator if he had shown bravery and fought well. In fact, if the fighter lost, the public would often grant him another shot at glory. A gladiator could also surrender when clearly outmatched by the opponent, or had lost his weapons. He indicated this by raising his left arm with the index finger extended and was at the mercy of the editor or sponsor to decide the fate of the defeated. The audience's reaction was crucial because whoever organized the games wanted to be popular, and the people could make or break that popularity. Another recurring myth is that ancient Romans would signal for death by giving a thumbs down and a clenched fist. Actually, it was the editor who made that gesture not the audience. When the public wanted their feelings known, they would shout, Mite, let him go, or Ugula, cut his throat. There were different categories of gladiators according to combat styles and equipment they used. The Samnites had a large oblong shield, helmet with a visor, crest, and feather crest, metallic greave on the left leg, leather or metal arm guard, partially covering the right shoulder, a short sword or gladius. Then we had the Myrmelons. They had a helmet with wide edges and a high crest in the shape of a fish, an armor on their left leg and right arm, a curved rectangular shield of the Roman legion, and a gladius sword. The Thracians had a small rectangular shield called Parmula a very short sword with a slightly curved blade called Sika, an armor on both legs, 
necessary due to the small size of their shield, shoulder, and sword arm protector. Helmet with a lateral plume, visor, and a high crest. The Secutor was armed with a sword, a smooth helmet, a large rectangular shield, protections on the right arm and leg. Then the Retiarius. He had a net, a trident, and a dagger. The Homoplachi were armed with a lance and a dagger. Helmet with feathered visors, high shin guards, manika, and a shield. Then came the Provocator. He was armed with a sword, helmet, large rectangular shield, shin guards, and a right arm protector. This was the only type of gladiator that did not face an opponent outside of his category, which gave rise to exciting fights because the fighters were more evenly matched. All other fighters fought in different pairs. There were more types of gladiators, but these are the most important. To regulate and supervise the fights, there was the figure of the Summa Rudis, who acted like a referee. The truth is that the death rate of gladiators in the circus was actually lower than in other events like horse racing. Usually, a gladiator fought between two and five times a year, and sometimes their death didn't even happen in the arena. Their wounds could get infected and eventually become deadly. When a gladiator finished their career, they were given a wooden sword called a rudus, which meant they were free. Some of these gladiators even became super popular, like famous football players do today. You might have heard the saying, Ave Caesar, Morituri de Salutant, which means, Hail Caesar, those who are about to die salute you. It's from a book called Lives of the Twelve Caesars by a fellow named Suetonius. It was said by criminals who were about to be executed, but not by gladiators as far as we know. In the arena, gladiators of the same category didn't usually fight each other. The audience preferred to see different weapons and skills in action to make the fights more exciting. There were also group fights called Grigaton. Now that's a spectacle worth seeing. Before the battles began, the gladiators would warm up in what was called Prelucio, and their weapons were inspected. Once ready to fight, they greeted the editor with a nod, and he started the show. And as I said before, two referees accompanied the gladiators, the main one, the Summa Rudis, and the assistant, the Secunda Rudis. They were also joined by the Lorari. These were fight inciters or instigators, who carried a whip or a hot iron to encourage any hesitant fighters to amp up their intensity. The rules required a clean fight, where the skill of the contender is showcased, not a bloodbath. In the year 90 AD, during Domitian's reign, a victor shocked everyone by refusing to execute the defeated. From then on, it was up to the victors to decide the fate of the defeated. And guess what happened? Against all odds, the victorious gladiators started executing their opponents. This is why there was an increase in deaths during the 2nd and 3rd centuries. After a gladiator emerged victorious, they received all sorts of honors. A lap around the arena, a fancy laurel crown, souvenirs tossed from the stands, a bag of coins, and a public celebration. The deceased was stripped of their armor. The body was handed over to whoever claimed it, either their family or fellow gladiators, to give them a dignified burial. If no one claimed the defeated gladiator, the gladiator college of the city where they fell, or some wealthy admirer buried them. In a pit close to the theater of Ephesus, archaeologists found a gladiator graveyard with the remains of 68 individuals, 67 men and one woman, with an estimated age between 20 and 30 years old. They were all buried in the second century after death. And that's all for today's episode. 
I hope you enjoyed and maybe learned a few things about the gladiator battles back in the ancient Roman Empire. If you enjoyed it, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.